Good day, everyone. What is jurisdiction? Jurisdiction is the power and authority of the court to hear, try, and decide the case. This is also referred to as the power or capacity given by the law to a court or tribunal to entertain, hear, and determine certain controversies. But jurisdiction is not only the authority to hear, try, and determine a case, but this is also the authority to execute the decisions rendered by the court because the power to control the execution of its decision is an essential aspect of jurisdiction. The most important part of a litigation, whether civil or criminal, is the process of execution of decision where supervening events may change the circumstances of the parties and compel courts to determine or to intervene and adjust the rights of litigants to prevent any unfairness. Jurisdiction is the authority to decide the case and not the decision rendered therein. The authority to decide the case and not the decision rendered is what makes up jurisdiction. But when it appears that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter of a complaint filed before it, the court has the duty to dismiss the claim and can do so moto proprio or on its own. Even if the parties do not challenge the jurisdiction of a court or a tribunal, this does not prevent the court from addressing the issue, especially where the lack of jurisdiction is apparent on the face of the complaint or a petition. So what is the effect of lack of jurisdiction? The proceedings conducted or the decisions rendered by a court are legally void where there is an absence of jurisdiction over the subject matter. And the judgment of a court without jurisdiction over the subject matter may be set aside and vacated at any time by the court that rendered it. A decision rendered by a court devoid of jurisdiction may be subject of a collateral attack if that jurisdictional defect appears on the face of the record and where the lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter appears on the face of the record, an appellate court may on its own initiative dismiss the action. There are four important aspects of jurisdiction. We have jurisdiction over the subject matter, jurisdiction over the parties, jurisdiction over the issues of the case, and jurisdiction over the rest or thing involved in litigation. Let's discuss them one at a time. Jurisdiction over the subject matter. This is referred to as the power of a particular court to hear the type of case that is pending before it. The term also refers to the jurisdiction of the court over the class of cases to which a particular case belongs. So following this definition, Real actions, personal actions, or actions incapable of pecuniary estimation are to be considered as subject matters. And the term subject matter also refers to the item with respect to which the controversy has arisen or concerning which the wrong has been done and is ordinarily the right, the thing, or the contract under dispute. So in this extended definition, the matters giving rise to, for example, unlawful detainer, forcible entry, these are subject matters. So are those giving rise to action publiciana, action reivindicatoria, partition of property, foreclosure, mortgage, expropriation, habeas corpus, and action for damages. These are subject matters. So when a complaint is filed in court, the basic question that is to be immediately resolved by the court is what is the subject matter of a complaint filed before it? So does the court have jurisdiction over the subject matter? If the answer is yes, then the court has jurisdiction over the subject matter. Take note that the jurisdiction over the subject matter is conferred by law, either by the constitution or by the statute. And it is the law that confers jurisdiction, not the rules of court. Rules of procedure yield to substantive law. So otherwise stated, jurisdiction must exist as a matter of law because only the statute can confer 
jurisdiction on courts. Jurisdiction being a matter of substantive law, the established rule is that the statute in force at the time of the commencement of the action determines the jurisdiction of the court. Since jurisdiction over the subject matter is conferred by statute, it cannot be granted by mere agreement of the parties. It cannot be acquired, waived, enlarged, or diminished by any act or mission of the parties. And it cannot be conferred by mere acquiescence of the courts. In short, jurisdiction may not be changed by mere agreement of the parties. It cannot be conferred by consent or waiver. It cannot be waived by parties or cured by their silence or express consent. It is neither for the court nor the parties to violate or disregard the rule on jurisdiction because jurisdiction is legislative in character. So where a complaint seeking for the payment, let's say 3 million pesos, is filed at the regional trial court, but after considering the evidence presented, the court rendered a judgment of only 300,000 pesos, which is an amount within the municipal trial court if originally filed. So the regional trial court where the case is originally filed did not lose jurisdiction over the, the action. It therefore has the authority to render judgment for 300,000 pesos. However, the above rule does not apply in reverse. So where a complaint for a recovery of loan, let's say 300,000 pesos, is originally filed in the municipal trial court, but after consideration of the evidence presented, it, it is shown that the amount recoverable is 3 million pesos, which is within the jurisdictional amount for cases at the regional trial court if originally filed, then the municipal trial court cannot render judgment for 3 million pesos for lack of jurisdiction. Also take note, that while the allegations in the complaint make out a case for forcible entry where tenancy is averred by way of defense, and if it is proved to be the real issue, meaning the tenancy agreement, the case should be dismissed for lack of jurisdiction, as the case should be properly filed with the Darab, formerly the Court of Agrarian Relations. Also, take note that the Municipal Trial Court does not automatically lose its jurisdiction over ejectment cases by the mere allegation of defense of tenancy relationship between the parties. But there must be reception of evidence. And if after hearing, um, tenancy had in fact been shown to be the real issue, the court should dismiss the case for lack of jurisdiction. But still, the rule is that jurisdiction of the court is determined by the allegations of the complaint. So, since the rule is that jurisdiction is determined by the allegations of the complaint, the allegations which comprise a concise statement of ultimate facts constituting the plaintiff's cause of action must be examined. The nature of action as well as which court or body has jurisdiction over it is determined based on the allegations contained in the complaint of the plaintiff irrespective of whether or not the plaintiff is entitled to recover upon all or some of the claims asserted, asserted therein. The averments in the complaint and the character of the relief sought are the ones to be consulted and once vested by the allegations in the complaint, jurisdiction remains irrespective of whether or not the plaintiff is entitled to recover upon all or some of the claims asserted therein. Also note that jurisdiction over subject matter is not affected by the pleas or theories set up by the defendant in the answer or a motion to dismiss. For otherwise, the question of jurisdiction would almost entirely depend upon the defendant. This has to be so for otherwise the ends of justice would be frustrated by making the sufficiency of this kind of action dependent upon the defendant in all cases. So what determines the jurisdiction of the court is the nature of the action pleaded as appearing from the allegations in the complaint. The averments therein and the character of the relief sought are the ones to be consulted or examined by the court.
While it is true that jurisdiction over the subject matter may be raised at any time or any stage of the proceedings since it is conferred by law, it is also settled that a party may be barred from raising it on the ground of estoppel. Estoppel prevents a party from questioning jurisdiction when a party has actively participated in all stages of a case, including invoking the authority of the court in seeking affirmative relief and questioning the court's jurisdiction later, only after receiving a ruling or decision that is adverse to his case. And the question of jurisdiction is obviously for the purpose of annulling everything done in the trial court in which he has actively participated. Please uh, review the case of Tiham versus Sibung Hanoi because the Supreme Court declared that the court frowns upon the unde undesirable practice of submitting one's case for decision and then accepting the judgment only if favorable, but attacking it for lack of jurisdiction if it is not. But take note, the rule on estoppel also applies to administrative proceedings because the active participation of an individual before the administrative proceedings and the belated challenge to the jurisdiction uh, of the said body bars him from assailing such acts under the principle of stoppel. You have the case of Office of the Ombudsman versus De Lijero Jr. The ruling in Tiham on the matter of jurisdiction is, however, the exception rather than the rule relating to jurisdiction over the subject matter. This was mentioned in the case of Kalimlim versus Ramirez. According to the Supreme Court in Kalimlim, Estoppel by latches may be invoked to bar the issue of lack of jurisdiction only in cases in which the facts are analogous to that in Tiham. In such controversies, latches should have been clearly present. That is, lack of jurisdiction must have been raised so belatedly as to warrant the presumption that the party entitled to assert it had abandoned or declined to assert it. In Tiham, the defense of lack of jurisdiction was raised for the first time in a motion to dismiss filed by the surety company almost 15 years after the questioned ruling had been rendered. At several stages of the proceedings, in the Court of Co, as well as in the Court of Appeals, the surety invoked the jurisdiction of the said courts to obtain affirmative relief and submitted its case for final adjudication on the merits. It was only when the adverse decision was rendered by the Court of Appeals that it finally woke up to raise the question of jurisdiction. So, obviously, because of Estoppel, a party is now barred to raise the issue of jurisdiction over the subject matter. Moving on to the second aspect of jurisdiction is the jurisdiction over the parties. Jurisdiction over the parties is the legal power of the court to render a personal judgment against a party to an action or proceeding. So in 2009 bar examination, it was asked, how is jurisdiction over the party over the parties acquired? So the manner by which the court acquires jurisdiction over the parties depends on whether the party is the plaintiff or the defendant. Because Jurisdiction over the plaintiff is acquired by his filing of the complaint or petition. By doing so, he submits himself to the jurisdiction of the court. How about jurisdiction over the person of the defendant? In civil cases, this is acquired either by his voluntary appearance in court and submission to its authority or by service of summons. Now, jurisdiction is acquired when the defendant voluntarily appears in court. The defendant's voluntary appearance in the action is equivalent to service of someone as mentioned in Rule 14, Section 20 of the Rules of Court. Hence, the court may acquire jurisdiction over the person of the defendant without service of summons or despite defective service of summons. As a rule, an appearance in whatever form without expressly objecting to the jurisdiction of the court over the person is a submission to the jurisdiction of the court. 
the submission to the court's jurisdiction takes the form of an appearance that seeks affirmative relief except when the relief sought is for the purpose of objecting the jurisdiction of the court over the person of the defendant. Examples, when the defendant files um, a pleading or when the defendant files a motion for reconsideration of the judgment by default or when the defendant files a petition to set aside a judgment of default or when the party jointly submit or the parties jointly submit a compromise agreement for approval of the court. So these are the filing of these pleadings are considered voluntary appearance in court. When is jurisdiction over the person of the defendant required? Now, this is required only in an action in personam. But jurisdiction over the person of the defendant is not required or is not a prerequisite in an action in rem or in quasi in rem. What is an action in personam? This is an action against the person on the basis of his personal liability. In an action in personam, jurisdiction over the person of the defendant is necessary for the court to validly try and decide a case. What is an action in rem? An action in rem is an action against the thing itself instead of against the person. What is an, an action quasi in rem? This is one wherein an individual is named as defendant and the purpose of the proceeding is to subject his interest therein to the obligation or lien burdening the property that is quasi in rem. Petition directed against the thing itself or the rest, which concerns the status of a person, like a petition for adoption, annulment of marriage, or correction of entries in the birth certificate, are actions in REM. I repeat, huh? petitions involving or which concern status of a person, like a petition for adoption, annulment of marriage, correction of entries in the birth certificate, are actions in REM. For future proceedings are also considered actions in rem. In an action in personam, jurisdiction over the person of the defendant is necessary for the court to validly try and decide the case. In a proceeding in rem or quasi in rem, jurisdiction over the person of the defendant is not a prerequisite to confer jurisdiction on the court provided that the, the court has jurisdiction over the rest. So, to summarize, jurisdiction over the, the rest is only acquired by seizure of the property under legal process where it is brought into actual custody or as, as a result of institution of legal proceedings in which the court is recognized and made effective. So, the service of summons or notice to the defendant is not for the purpose of vesting the court with jurisdiction but merely for the purpose of satisfying the due process requirements. How about jurisdiction over the issues? This is the power of the court to try and decide issues raised in the pleadings of the parties. What is an issue? An issue is a disputed point or question to which parties on action have narrowed down their several allegations and upon which they are desirous of obtaining a decision. So that is an issue. Jurisdiction over the issues is conferred by and determined by the pleadings of the parties. The pleadings present the issues to be raised and it determine whether or not the issues are of fact or of law. In order to determine whether or not the court has jurisdiction over the issues or issue over the issues of the case, one must examine the pleadings. An issue arises because a material allegation of a claiming party is specifically denied by a defending party. The denial to be specific must be one which conforms to any of the denials prescribed in Rule 8 of the Rules of Court. A denial made not in accordance with Rule 8 is to be construed as an admission, a circumstance which does not give rise to an issue. Thus, where the defendant admits all the material allegations of fact of a claiming party, there is no controverted issue between the parties. And under Rule 34 of the Rules of Court, 
when an answer fails to tender an issue or otherwise admits the material allegations of the adverse party's pleading, a judgment on the pleadings may be rendered by the court upon a motion properly filed by a party. Jurisdiction over the issues may also be determined and conferred by stipulation of the parties as when there is a pretrial, so that is the number two, as to how jurisdiction over the issues is conferred. So during pretrial, the parties enter into stipulations of facts and documents or enter into an agreement for the purpose of simplifying the issues of the case. Thirdly, jurisdiction over the issues may be conferred by a waiver or failure to object to the presentation of evidence on a matter not raised in the pleading. So here, the parties try with their expressed or implied consent issues not raised by the pleadings. So the issues tried shall be treated in all respects as if they had been raised in the pleadings. So how do you distinguish jurisdiction over the issue from jurisdiction over the subject matter? So jurisdiction over the subject matter is being conferred by law, while jurisdiction over the issues is determined or conferred by the pleadings. Jurisdiction over the issue may be conferred by consent of either parties, express or implied. Although an issue is not duly pleaded, it may be validly tried and decided if no timely objection is made thereto by the party pursuant to Section 5, Rule 10. But this cannot be done when jurisdiction over the subject matter is involved. And finally, jurisdiction over the rest. Rest in civil law is a thing, an object, and it includes subject matter or status. Jurisdiction over the rest refers to the court's jurisdiction over the thing or the property which is the subject of the action. This type of jurisdiction is necessary when the action is an action in rem or quasi in rem. What is required is jurisdiction over the rest or thing, although summons must also be served upon the defendant in order to satisfy the requirements of due process. When the action is one in personam, jurisdiction over the rest is not sufficient to authorize the court to render judgment against the defendant. In an action in personam, jurisdiction over the parties or over the person of the defendant is required. So how does the court acquire jurisdiction over the rest? First is by placing the property in custody or custodia lehis. Or second, there can be um, constructive seizure, for example, attachment. In such a case, the court acquires jurisdiction over the rest. Or third, the third mode is the institution of legal proceedings wherein, under special provision of law, the power of court over the property is recognized. For example, suits involving status of parties. So, for example, in number three, the registration of the title of land under the system for the registration of the land is an example of the institution of legal proceedings where the court acquires jurisdiction over the rest. Here, the court, without taking actual physical control over the property, assumes at the instance of some person claiming to be the owner to exercise a jurisdiction in rem over the property and to adjudicate the title in favor of the petitioner against all the world. So a land registration case is a proceeding in rem and jurisdiction over the rest cannot be acquired unless there is constructive seizure of the land through publication and service of notice. Any relief granted in rem or quasi in rem actions must be confined to the rest and the court cannot legally render a judgment against the defendant. In an action to foreclose a real estate mortgage where the jurisdiction acquired by the court is only over the rest and not over the, the person of the defendant because, the let's say, the debtor mortgager is a non-resident who is also outside the Philippines, the relief of the creditor extends only to the property foreclosed. If in the foreclosure, say, let's say, a deficiency arises, 
So a deficiency judgment authorized under Rule 68, Section 6 against the debtor mortgager would not be feasible. This is because the collection of the de deficiency is a proceeding in personam which requires jurisdiction over the person of the debtor mortgager. There being no personal jurisdiction over the person, then a deficiency judgment cannot be rendered against him. Congress enacted Republic Act 11576 on July 30, 2021, expanding the jurisdictional amount cognizable by the first level courts in civil cases up to 2 million pesos. And it also expands the jurisdictional amount with respect to recovery of real property with assessed value of up to 400,000 pesos. So what is the effect? Under Section 1 of RA 11576, the RTC, or Regional Trial Court, shall exercise exclusive original jurisdiction over the following. Number 1, in all cases which involve Title 2 or possession of real property or any interest therein where the assessed value exceeds 400,000 pesos except for forcible entry, unlawful detainer where the original action is conferred upon the municipal trial courts. Also, number two, the RTC shall exercise exclusive original jurisdiction in all actions in admiralty and maritime jurisdiction where the demand or claim exceeds 2 million pesos. Third, in all matters of probate, both testate and intestate where the gross value of the estate exceeds 2 million pesos. And fourth, in all other cases in which the demand exclusive of interest, damages of whatever kind, attorney's fees, litigations, litigation expenses and costs, or the value of the property in controversy exceeds 2 million pesos. And under Section 2 of RA 115, 76. The MTC shall exercise exclusive original jurisdiction over civil actions and probate proceedings, both testate and interstate, including the grant of provisional remedies in proper cases where the value of the property, estate, or amount of the demand does not exceed 2 million pesos, exclusive of interest, damages of whatever kind, attorney's fees, litigation expenses and costs, the amount of which must be specifically alleged, provided that where there are several claims or causes of actions between the same or different parties embodied in the same complaint, the amount of the demand shall be the totality of all claims in the causes of action, irrespective of whether the causes of action arose out of the same or different transactions. The MTC shall also um, exercise exclusive original jurisdiction in all civil cases which involve Title II or possession of real property or any interest therein where the assessed value of the property or any interest therein does not exceed 400,000 pesos exclusive of interest, damages of whatever kind, attorney's fees, litigation expenses and costs provided that in, in cases of land not declared for taxation purposes, the value of such property shall be determined by the assessed value of the adjacent lots. And third, the MTC shall exercise exclusive original jurisdiction in admiralty and maritime actions where the demand reclaim does not exceed $2 million. Pesos. Let's discuss venue. Venue is the place or the geographical area in which a court with jurisdiction may hear and determine a case, or this is the place where the case is to be tried. Venue is procedural and not substantive. In civil cases, venue is not a matter of jurisdiction. Venue becomes jurisdictional only in criminal cases. So, for example, where the information is filed in a place where the offense was not committed, the information may be quashed in some cases 
due to lack of jurisdiction over the offense charge. This is not so in a civil case where improper venue is not equivalent to lack of jurisdiction because it is merely procedural, the parties can waive the issues on venue of a case. So the basic analysis is, in order to know the venue of a particular action, the basic and initial step is to determine if the action is personal or real action. If it is a personal action, the venue is deemed transitory, thus it generally depends upon the residences of the parties. If it is a real action, the venue is local, and thus it generally follows that the venue is the place where the property or where any portion of the same is situated. We have Rule 4 of the Rules of Court on Venue of Actions. Under Section 1, actions affecting Title 2 or possession of real property or interest therein shall be commenced and tried in the proper court which has jurisdiction over the area wherein the real property is involved or a portion thereof is situated. So Section 1 speaks of the venue of real actions. This is where you file a case. It shall be commenced and tried in the proper court which has jurisdiction over the area wherein the real property is involved or a portion thereof is situated. How about the venue of personal actions? The venue in personal actions is where the plaintiff or any of the principal plaintiffs resides or where the defendant or any of the principal defendant resides or in the case of a non-resident defendant where he may be found at the election of the plaintiff. So it is the plaintiff who has the option as to where he will commence the action. If the defendant is a non-resident, the venue is where the plaintiff or any of the principal plaintiff resides or where the non-resident defendant may be found at the election of the plaintiff. If the defendant does not reside and is not found in the Philippines and the action affects the personal status of the plaintiff or any property of said defendant located in the Philippines, then the action may be commenced and tried in the court of the place where the plaintiff resides or where the property or any portion thereof is situated or found. So again, if the defendant does not reside in the Philippines and the action affects the personal status of the plaintiff or where any property of said defendant is located in the Philippines, then action may be commenced and tried in the court of the place where the plaintiff resides or where the property or any portion thereof is situated or found. In an action for damages or actions to collect a sum of money, it must be filed in either the residence of the plaintiff or the residence of the defendant at the election of the plaintiff since such actions are personal. In an action for collection, or let's say, collection of sum of money worth 1 million pesos, if this is filed by a resident of, let's say, Cebu City against a resident of Mandawe, Mandawe City, then the filing of the collection case can be either in the proper court of Mandawe, Mandawe City or Cebu City at the option of the plaintiff. In actions to recover ownership of real property, these are real actions. So it must be filed in the place where the real property is located. How about in an unlawful detainer, forcible entry, and action publiciana? These are also real actions and they must likewise be filed in the place where the subject property is situated. So in an action to recover possession of um, real property and payment of accrued rentals, so it must be filed in the municipality where the property is located because the action is a real action. 
in a forcible entry and detainer actions, it shall be commenced and tried in the municipal trial court of the municipality or city where the real property is involved or portion thereof is situated. Take note also that the rule on venue does not apply where specific law provides otherwise or where the parties agreed in writing on the exclusive venue. So what do we mean by letter A where specific law provides otherwise? So we have an example. Um, it means that if a certain rule provides that the filing of the venue shall be in a particular place, then you follow that rule. Example of letter A where specific law provides otherwise is um, Section 7, Rule 66 of the Rules of Court in a Kuwaranto proceeding because the Solicitor General is allowed to initiate Kuwaranto not only in the Court of Appeals and Supreme Court but also in the Regional Trial Court. However, if the Solicitor General initiates a Kuwaranto proceeding at the Regional Trial Court, Rule 66, Section 7 is specific that the Kuwaranto proceeding is to be filed in the Regional Trial Court of Manila. We do not follow the rule in, uh, in a personal action that the filing of the case shall be in the place where the plaintiff or the defendant resides at the option of the plaintiff because Section 7, Rule 66 is very specific that in a Kuwaranto proceeding, the filing of the case aside from Court of Appeals and Supreme Court is at the Regional Trial Court of Manila. For letter B, where the parties have validly agreed in writing before the filing of the action on the exclusive venue, the parties may agree on a specific venue, which could be a place neither of them resides. So the parties may stipulate on the venue as long as the agreement is in writing and it is made before the filing of the action and there is exclusivity as to the venue. When writing stipulations as to venue, the Supreme Court declared that venue stipulations are either mandatory, meaning restrictive, or it can be permissive. When the venue stipulated is mandatory or restrictive, the complaint is to be filed only in the stipulated venue. Now, when the stipulated venue is merely permissive, the complaint may be filed in the place designated by the rules or in the place stipulated in the agreement. The agreed place on venue thus becomes a permissible venue in addition to, to those provided for by the rules of court. For example, a stipulation that any suit arising from this contract shall be filed only in Quezon City. This stipulation is exclusive in character and clear enough, uh, it precludes the filing of the action in any other places. Meanwhile, a stipulation that the parties agree to sue and be sued in the courts of Manila, according to the Supreme Court, this stipulation is permissive only. In Politrade Corporation versus Blanco, according to the Supreme Court, the plain meaning of said provision is that the parties merely consented to be sued in the courts of Manila, considering that there are no qualifying or restrictive words which would indicate that Manila and Manila alone is the agreed venue. It simply is permissive and the parties did not waive their right to pursue the remedy in the courts specifically mentioned in the rules of court. While stipulations regarding venue is considered valid and enforceable, it does not supersede the general rule on venue and the rule for in the absence of qualifying or restrictive words. So if the intention of the parties were to restrict venue, there must be accompanying language clearly and categorically expressing their purpose and design that actions between them be litigated only at the place named by them. Examples of words with restrictive meanings are only, solely, exclusively in this court, in no other court save, 
particularly nowhere else but except for words of equal import. A court may not dismiss an action moto proprio on the ground of improper venue. Why? Because improper venue is not one of the grounds wherein the court may dismiss an action moto proprio on the basis of pleadings. The court may only dismiss an action moto proprio in case of lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter, litis pendentia, res judicata, and prescription. So, in one case, the court moto proprio dismiss an action based on improper venue. According to the Supreme Court in Rudolf Leitz Holdings Incorporated versus Registry of Deeds, the trial court erred when it dismissed the petition moto proprio. Why? It should have waited for a motion to dismiss or a responsive pleading from respondent raising the objection or affirmative defense of improper venue before dismissing the petition. So, unless and until the defendant objects to the venue in a motion to dismiss, then the venue cannot be truly said to be improperly laid because the venue, although technically wrong, may be acceptable to the parties for whose convenience the rules on venue have been Device. The trial court cannot preempt the defendant's prerogative to object to the improper laying of the venue by moto proprio dismissing the case. If in a case filed with the regional trial court, the defendant files a motion to dismiss based on lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter and the court instead dismisses the action based on, let's say, improper venue, the court would be acting erroneously because the act would tantamount to a moto proprio dismissal based on improper venue, which is not allowed. So the court may, however, moto proprio dismiss improper venue for cases covered by the rules on summary procedure and in small claims. So again, ha, a court may not dismiss an action moto proprio on the ground of improper venue because such ground must be raised in the pleadings filed by the adverse party. So no moto proprio dismissal. However, the court may moto proprio dismiss a case on the ground of improper venue if the action is covered by the rules on summary procedure and in small claims cases. So kindly read the rules on expedited procedures in the first level courts. You have AM number 08-8 dash 7 dash SC. If a motion to dismiss based on improper venue is denied, may the defendant appeal? The answer is no. So because an order denying a motion to dismiss is merely interlocutory. It's not final. And only final orders, judgments, or decisions may be appealed from by filing a mere notice of appeal. If your motion to dismiss based on improper venue is denied by the trial court, the normal remedy is to file an answer and interpose the ground as an affirmative defense. Then you proceed to trial and once there is the decision, that's the time you appeal from the adverse judgment. But as an exception, if the denial of your motion to dismiss based on improper venue is tainted with grave abuse of discretion, then the remedy is certiorari and prohibition. And that ends our discussion on jurisdiction and venue. Thank you.